Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jeffrey Dombacher. Jeffrey's background was originally in the ecology of stream fishes and management of watersheds. His desire to understand the complex relationships of fish communities, rivers, and watersheds led him to the method of qualitative mathematics as a tool to understand the dynamics of complex systems. This research goal broadened to include general solutions to resource management problems embedded in diverse ecological and socioeconomic systems. His work within CSIRO provides a diverse array of challenges in which to carry out this work. Now it's my pleasure to share Jeffrey Dombacher's presentation with you. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Dombacher and I'm with the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Hobart, Australia. It's a pleasure today to be part of the Decision and Analysis Tools for Complex Problems lecture series. And the title of my talk today is Qualitative Mathematical Modeling for Understanding, Prediction, and Intervention in Complex Systems. So, the, um, I'm starting out by giving an overview of what I consider to be the, the focus and scope of research problems generally uh, as the state of affairs. And if we look at the number of processes involved in a problem and the number of process interactions uh, and the time and space scales upon which those processes are based and the number of disciplines involved in studying those processes, we can define what could be generally called uh, depending upon the, the scale of these, uh, these different attributes, narrow focus problems and broad focus problems. Narrow focus problems have fewer processes, fewer interactions, narrower um, divisions of time and space scales involved, and fewer disciplines. And these are where we make our cutting edge science uh, progress. Um, the greater proportions of advances in, uh, of these are in, in problems that are amenable to narrowly focused approach. But broad focus problems have are complex require that are complex require critical questions that emerging not at a narrow edge of a single discipline, but rather along the broad intersection of many disciplines. Here, our collective endeavor becomes not cutting edge science, but joining edge science. And this requires an interdisciplinary approach. And the challenges to interdisciplinary research are well known. Uh, first and foremost, historically, have been institutional barriers and silos within um, subsets of the organization or between uh, disciplines or, uh, across organizations. Also, sustaining collaborations between research groups and individuals that have a common interest. It can be difficult due to funding arrangements or institutional um, arrangements, uh, flow of information, things like that. Um, also, effective communication can be a difficulty. Now, institutional barriers and silos in places like the CSIRO um, have been worn down and uh, broken down quite effectively, and we do a lot of uh, interdisciplinary collaborations in, in, in CSRO, and I believe this is the case around the world as well. We see more of this happening uh, as time progresses. Now, sustaining collaborations between research groups and individuals has also made some great progress recently, and we, we see a great, especially with the, uh, the, the internet now, that there's a lot of uh, worldwide collaborations between groups and individuals, so we think we're doing a better job of these two. However, effective communication is still questionable, and here we have some common problems. There's a fixation on jargon and semantics within a discipline that makes it difficult to, to discuss across disciplines. Uh, the world views uh, uh, are, are based upon the inherent structure of the objects of our own interests, and these have a temporal structure, a spatial structure, and also an organizational structure. This requires to break down th this problem requires conceptual syntheses that make clear which components and processes of a system are relevant to the problem at hand, but more importantly, which are not. Um, here's, for example, are different hierarchies of research approach that can lead to uh, barriers in communication or understanding. We have a clinical organismal level of looking at things where they work between in vitro and in vivo. Um, population and community ecologists work from the organism up through the population community and biome, 
where systems approaches are less concerned about organisms, but more concerned about functional units, looking at total ecosystems, biomes, up to the total biosphere. These sorts of arrangements uh, make it difficult to talk when we have problems that we need to integrate across these different uh, approaches. So this is the problem of the interdisciplinary discourse, uh, well described by XKD, XKCD.com, where here we have the fields of, uh, of science arranged by purity, with more pure to the right. And unfortunately, the sociologists are delegated to the left-hand side, and psychologists like to know, like us to know that, that sociology is just applied psychology. And biologists are quite happy to say that psychology is just applied biology. With the chemists saying that biology is just applied chemistry, and the physicists are very happy to say that it's just applied physics, it's nice to be on top. And there to the right is our wonderful mathematician saying, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way over there. And here, I think we need to understand that the role of mathematicians is actually to help these people talk together. And Richard Levins was very concerned about this from the very beginning of his career, where he said that the role of mathematics is to, make, is to educate through intuition and to make the obscure obvious. And this is not just a, a topic of, of mathematicians. Uh, it goes across all arts and sciences like Charles Mingus, a famous jazz musician, said making the simple complicated is commonplace, making the complicated simple awesomely simple, that's creativity. And so these are the ways that we need to approach complexity is through both art and science. And with Richard Levins, it's a, it's a strategy and model building that he developed in the 60s that I have taken forward in, in my approach at CSIRO where we look at the goals of mathematical modeling. And first and foremost, it's to understand the world and to help us make predictions about the future and to help us intervene in the world as well. And to do that, we make abstractions with mathematics. And these models or, or abstractions of the world have attributes that we would like in them. We would like our models to have reality, generality, and precision. We would like reality to be in the models in terms of what we observe, the objects of interest in the real world are reflected back in our equations. So we have births, rates of birth or death or um, maturation. These are, are, are parameters that we can uh, make measurements of in, in the world based on population studies and reflect them back in parameters in our models. We would also like these parameters to have precision so we can know precisely how much a population is going to increase or decrease due to a change in a factor. We would also like our models to be general so that we can transport them to different situations uh, in space or time or have them be adjustable to a small change in the environment or maybe a large change in the environment. We would like them to, be, to span different contexts of problems. The difficulty comes in that you cannot maximize all three of these attributes in any one modeling framework or any one model, it's instantiation of a model. So there's a necessary trade-off that comes. And if you sacrifice realism for the sake of uh, generality and precision, then you have what we could call statistical models, where we have good, precise correlations between variables, but we don't necessarily know exact causal understanding causal structure of the relationship between, say, variable x and variable y. So while we, we might have precise measures of correlation between these variables, we lack causation. We can call models that lack generality but maximize realism and precision as mechanistic models. These are also known as numerical simulation models. And here we have precise measurements that we can put into our, our, our parameters of, of real um, processes that we observe in the world, and these are uh, based upon um, large simulations of, of real processes interacting in, in an abstract space. Now, unfortunately, because of the, the high number of parameters and the interdependence of the, the parameter space that is created by these parameters to create a stable working model, these models often lack generality. And any small change in a parameter space can, um, or in a single parameter, can greatly restrict 
its uh, use in another uh, context. And so you cannot necessarily um, take a model that is with many parameters that are precisely attuned and apply them to a new situation without revisiting the entire parameter space. Both statistical and mechanistic models are data hungry based upon their, uh, their maximization of precision. And that is, can be very um, uh, you know, data intensive and so those can be expensive to create. However, if we're willing to give up our uh, need for precision and instead maximize or embrace models that are real and general, we have what Richard Levins called qualitative models. And these were the models that, that he was uh, pushed and favored in his uh, work in population biology. These models uh, represent processes that are found in the world um, and they're very uh, generalizable because they lack precision. So they don't give you exactly how much a variable will change due to another parameter change. Um, they only give you directional or they give you the slope of a relationship, positive or negative slopes, or there will be general increase and decrease in a variable due to a change in the environment. Now, each of these modeling frameworks on purpose leaves something out. Qualitative models on purpose um, turn their back on precision. Mechanistic models are not concerned about generality, and statistical models have little to say about causation or realism. So each, in a way, is telling a lie about the world on purpose. Now, Levin's approach was that we need to have different lines of evidence to converge upon a similar answer. Each model is based upon different simplifying assumptions. Each model framework, I should say, is based upon different simplifying assumptions. And our goal, then, to get a robust understanding about how the world works is to get different models with different approaches converge upon a common answer. And if we can achieve that, then he says that our truth is the intersection of independent lies. And this is really the approach that I've been pushing in the CSIRO uh, over the last 20 years, and it's one that has borne some fruits that I would like to share with you today. So first, let's understand what a qualitative model is with respect to an ecosystem approach or a biological approach. You can represent a system, um, here a predator and a prey system, the N1 here being the, the prey, and N2 being the predator with a set of differential equations. And we can have pro processes of birth and death in this equation. And here we have a predator with an interaction term that the alpha 1, 2, that's the effect to variable 1 from variable 2, has a negative effect on the prey population based on the abundance of the predator population here. Similarly, the birth rate of the predator is based on its interaction coefficient and the population of the prey. So these interaction terms describe the, 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 inter, the signs of the interaction between these populations. And if you had a precise understanding of these parameters, then you can make a quantitative or numerical simulation model about them. Um, we could take the, these interaction terms and put them in matrix form, and here we have the community matrix, also known as the Jacobian matrix, or matrix of first partial differentials. Um, these describe the relationships between the different variables in the system, and here just in a plus or minus framework. We can take the same information and put it into graphical form. Here we have a, what's called a sign-directed graph. The sign-directed graph has variables, here n1, and then two in these circles. And then the links between the circles, the, uh, the vertices, it's, uh, I mean, excuse me, the edges of the graph, show the rates of birth, here alpha two one, and the rates of death, alpha one two. So each of these relations, each of these depictions of, of a system have equivalent information, the sign-directed graph, the matrix form, or the differential equation form. With sign-directed graphs, you can portray all possible ecological interactions. Here, predator-prey, uh, positive-negative, as we saw before. Neutralism, where there's a positive um, mutual benefit to each variable, to one to the other. Commensalism is just one variable benefits another. Competition, where there's uh, pairwise negative interactions between two variables. Amensal, just a single negative link. 
And then we have these self-effects, which are uh, here on the left, negative self-effect, which is density dependent growth. So you might say as a population reaches its carrying capacity, the rate of birth might decrease or the rate of death might increase, both of which might create a negative uh, modulating effect on the population's growth rate. Uh, Self-enhancing relationships with, uh, within a population are, are usually rare or at least quickly um, uh, dampened down, but if they do break out of any um, 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 restrictions, then we have uh, expon un unrestrained exponential growth, and these are positive self-effects. Now, sign-directed graphs can be used to describe almost any sort of system. Here we have a, a comic uh, showing us that a telecom stock, stock soared as cell phone usage increased. And here all the, uh, the panicked um, buyers are saying, sell my telecom stock, sell my telecom stock. So this negating piece of humor um, can sh be sh shown as a sign directed graph where we have cell usage increases, leads to increase in stock price and increases in stock price would suppress cell phone usage. Um, this is an example of a negative feedback where we go a path from, the, uh, say, the cell phone usage variable out to all the variables in the system. Here, just one. Uh, you multiply the linkages that cycle from the variable back to itself. We have a positive times a negative link gives us a negative feedback cycle. So this means that any increase in cell usage as it percolates through the system Will be, cell, will be damped by the total system feedback, and cell phone usage will go back to an equilibrium level if there is a shock to it. So this is an example of negative feedback, and of course, all systems in biology are, are interlaced with negative feedbacks. Here's a, a, a few examples. We have an economic system where we have processes of competitive market adjustments that shows that demand will uh, increases will lead to an increase in price, but that increase in price will suppress demand. Now, the variables can easily switch place depending upon the definitions of the relationships, and we can have price as the starting variable, and have it uh, stimulate production, and production would suppress price. So, depending upon how you define the variables or the relationships, you can have um, a mix and match of different kinds of relationships with, with similar variables. If we look at uh, biological processes, consumption, fecundity, and mortality, th this is the basis of predator-prey interactions. Uh, we could go down to a, a, an in vitro level or I mean, within an organism and look at uh, stimulus response type relationships here with blood glucose and insulin, where we see that liver and cell uptake of glucose and glycogen storage is, is, is modulated by insulin levels in, in the blood. If you know the structure of the system, here I define the structure of the system by these positive negative relationships shared between all the variables in the system. And we know the overall feedback of the system, the, the last systems had negative overall feedback. Then we can make some pronouncements about if the system will be stable. And here, um, we know that if there's overall negative feedback, that the system, if perturbed, here the, uh, pr say, a predator a variable is, has an instantaneous increase, maybe through immigration into a, a, a certain habitat, and the prey population would be suppressed, but eventually uh, the system will go back to an equilibrium based upon uh, the, the new state of affairs. But if these systems have the chance to recover after, dis after disturbance if they have negative feedback. And this return to um, um, equilibrium can be asymptotic, here a smooth curve followed into a straight line, or oscillatory, depending upon if the eigenvalues of the system, which we don't have to talk about today so much, have imaginary components. But the uh, qualitative depiction of the system can inform you whether or not you're prone to having an asymptotic response or an oscillatory response. Both of these general behaviors can be discovered through the, sh the shape and form of the sign-directed graphs. If the overall feedback is positive, then we have an, um, an, an unstable system that cannot return to equilibrium, and this often leads to extinction after, after, after a disturbance. And this can happen in both asymptotic approach or an oscillatory approach.
If a system has neutral stability, where the, the net feedback is near zero, then it will, it will not return to equilibrium, equilibrium, but merely stay where you have placed it due to the perturbation. And this can, of course, can happen asymptotically or oscillatory. So this is just one half or just one part of what you can do, use the, uh, the structure, the qualitative structure of a system to discover is its potential for stability. The other is to understand the long-term response of this system to a change in conditions. And these are known as press perturbations. Here we generalize the differential equations to describe five different types of processes that can affect a population. And there is nothing in the world that you can't uh, pigeonhole into these five different kinds of parameters. We have um, um, interspecific uh, relationships here, uh, the predator-prey relationships or mutualism, commensalism, any of the uh, pairwise interactions that can be described by the sign directed graphs as we've shown between ver two variables can be shown in this, this uh, interaction coefficient here. And then we have intrinsic rates of birth and death and immigration and emigration here uh, through these other parameters. So anything that you can do to a population increasing its death rate, say through harvest or culling, would be uh, something that you could put into this parameter here, or birth rate by uh, feeding or um, increasing the, the, um, the, the fecundity of an organism. Any, anything you can imagine you can do as a manager or as a biologist experimentally can be thought of as to be contained in one of these parameters here. So if we say have an increase to this hare population, uh, say through uh, feeding it through rabbit pellets or inc increasing food availability, that would lead to an increase in its population. We would consider that a positive input. So if you're increasing the birth rate of, say, the rabbit population or the hare here. Um, this is also a link, so the hare links interaction here. If you increase the food supply to the hare, then what's, how you predict the change in the equilibrium of the system is to take this positive effect and make an attribution there to the variable of where its input occurs, and that's a positive prediction. And then take that positive times a positive link here and you get a positive prediction here for the predator. So if you increase the food supply of the prey qualitatively you predict an increase in the population abundance of both the prey and the predator. Conversely if you have a negative input to the predator say through a culling program or maybe you uh, uh, affect its ability to migrate into or out of a, um, a certain habitat then you can have a negative input to its population abundance in the habitat and it would have a negative prediction on that variable. And that negative times that negative here in this linkage gives us a positive prediction for the response of the prey population. So already we've, we've discovered the correlation structure or the statistical structure of how the system behaves due to inputs into the system. For a predator-prey relationship, if the world that changes, the part of the world that changes, changes enters in through the bottom of the system, then you have a positive correlation statistically between the uh, response variables. If the uh, input to the system comes in through the predator, then you would have a negative correlation measured in the response of the system. So, and this would be true if you had a positive input to the predator up here, say, then you would simply switch these signs and you get a positive here and a negative here, but the correlation structure would still be negative statistically measured. So using this tool, um, the simple tool of understanding how the system might change due to inputs into the system, we can learn a lot and, and progress our research programs in, in more complicated systems. For instance, Krebs et al. in 95 published an experiment where they looked at the uh, snowshoe hare cycle and the, its relationship with its predators, primarily lynx here, but also great horned owls. This was in the Yukon Forest in, in uh, Canada. Now, <coughs> now, hare food addition uh, experiments, they, they, they made bait stations where they fed the hares directly with rabbit pellets. They found uh, a statistically significant increase in hares. And in predator exclusions, where it's partial, they put up fences 
um, and kept out some of the predator uh, abundance, but not all of it, that they found that the hares also increased. If they did the food and exclusion experiments uh, together, then they found a multiplicative positive increase in hares. When they fertilized the vegetation, they noticed a dramatic increase in the vegetation's abundance above ground, but they had a neutral or zero measured response or non-significant uh, response in hairs. So we took these results and looked at not only the studies of Kreb at all, but the whole entire 50-year history of the snowshoe hair cycle in the Yukon. and. Um, created this um, matrix of predictions for all possible inputs to the different systems. Now, Krebs et al. thought, uh, implied that they had this model structure in their research, and if they have an increase to vegetation, then it shows an increase to, to uh, say, through fertilization, then it would predict from this model an increase to vegetation, hares, and predators, and that's reflected here by this plus plus and plus. So you read the predictions down the column. If you have an, a positive input to hairs, say through feeding, then this model here predicts a positive uh, effect here and a positive effect here for the predator and a negative effect on, on vegetation. And then if you have an input to the predators, then you would have a, a positive input here, would give a positive response in the predators, a negative to hairs, and a positive to vegetation. So this is the model that Krebs et al. thought they were working with. And when they um, had an input to vegetation, they expected a positive response here in hares. But what they found was a zero response, or a statistically non-significant response. And so we said, instead of disbelieving the model uh, structure that you had, or the results that you had, and say that, you know, Oh, what they said was that vegetation, excuse me, when they, when they observed a zero response here, when they expected a positive, they said that fertilization of vegetation was a poor way to feed hares. So we took the, uh, the opposite approach and said, well, let's believe that the uh, measured responses are, are accurate to the system, and let's therefore ask what model structure or what type of system would be consistent with the statistically measured responses that they observed. So all, this is a meta-analysis of not only their research, but all research done in the Yukon. And we found that if you put a zero here and have a plus here, a plus here, and a negative here, that this model structure is consistent with these results here, if you accept the zero prediction here. And in fact, this model doesn't give a perfect zero prediction. It actually gives an ambiguous prediction because it says that the response of hairs to a fertilization of vegetation can be either positive, negative, or zero. It can be positive if this link coming from vegetation to hairs is stronger than the link going from vegetation to predators back to hairs. If the uh, link from vegetation to predators back to hairs is stronger than the, the bottom-up effect, then you would get a negative response. If they're roughly equal, then in the field experiments, you would expect to get a zero or non-significant uh, response here. Now, we weren't certain about whether or not this model was true or not. And of course, predators, the, the, the lynx or the great horned owls don't eat grass. So there is no trophic relationship here. But during the time of the publication of this, they came out with a new study that said that uh, lynx use hunting beds where they crouch behind vegetation to ambush their prey, the hares. And so one could imagine that if vegetation provided a little more cover, uh, hiding cover for the, for the lynx, that it could be an effective method to increase the predation efficiency of the hares. And so that's what this lynx could possibly represent in real life, a process of a, of a, of a mediated interaction where vegetation affects the predator-prey relationship between predators and hares. Now, of course, we, I, when I wrote this, I was a fisheries biologist in Oregon. I've never been to the Yukon. I have no experience with this system in real life. But the, the, this qualitative modeling approach does provide uh, a way forward from this paradox. 
it suggests that there's a critical experiment that nobody has yet done in the Yukon for the hair link cycle. And that is to have an input to hairs and measure the response of the predators. And that would fall along the same linkages of the system, but here are backwards from uh, vegetation, hairs to vegetation, the predators would give you a, uh, a negative link, and directly here it would give a positive link to predators. Um, depending upon the strengths of these, you could get a, a negative or zero response, and if you did, that would land, add weight to model B. So uh, there's a critical experiment there to help decide whether uh, model A or model B is the correct model of the system. Let's look at another example where qualitative modeling can give you some insights about how to manage the system. Here we're looking at the Benguela upwelling ecosystem off of South Africa and there's a very productive fishery for hake and uh, the trouble was that the fishermen were complaining about the number of fur seals eating the, their catch. Uh, uh, and taking away their catch of hake. And so they, they implored the managers to um, institute a culling program where they would shoot the seals or kill the seals somehow and suppress their population abundance in the expectation that they would increase their landings of hake. Now, Peter Jotzitz uh, drew upon a wealth of diet studies um, and created a compartment flow model, much like an ecopath model today, uh, for the system and had uh, dozens of uh, variables and hundreds of parameters of, of um, you know, consumption-based parameters and growth rate parameters for all of the variables in the system. He basically described it from bacteria up to, ba up to baleen whales and everything in between. Um, it's a complete whole of system model, tries to understand the entire system as, as best they could and have precise parameter spaces to play with. And when he did numerical simulations upon this compartment flow model, um, he found that, yes, overall, if this is the zero line here and everything here is a, a positive response and everything here is a negative response where he divides the gain in hake yields divided by the number of seals called, uh, the numerical simulation results did support the, the uh, contention of the fishermen that if you were to call the seals, they would get more fish in their landing on the docks. And so this is a numerical simulation approach based upon a, a moderately complicated model of the system. But Andre Puntz uh, said, Peter, you don't have, need to have such a complicated model. We can approach this more simply. Let's just boil it down to three variables. We have seals like you have here, and we have hakes right here like you, a single variable. And we have the uh, landings going into the fishery here. This is a, a fishery harvest or the landings on the dock. And in this three variable model, we can have what he might call the essential, uh, the essential dynamics of the system where he tried to account for eight, at least 80% of the birth and mortality rates of the hakes with respect to seals in the fisheries. And left out maybe 20% of the, would be attributed to the species not left in the model of this simple three variable model. But he also noted that the situation is a little more complex than just uh, one population of hake and one uh, fishery here. Turns out there are two species of hakes that Yachts has collapsed into his model here for uh, this single variable. There's Merluceus capensis here, which uh, lives on the shelf and recruits from a juvenile life stage into an adult, and the adults create juveniles, so this is just a life, life stage model with sign directed graph. And the seals have a, a, a consumption of the Merluceus capensis on the shelf, and this is the fleet of fishing boats that are smaller than the offshore fleet, so this is a shelf-limited fishery uh, with smaller boats, and they fish exclusively on Merluceus capensis. Now, Merluceus paradoxus, the adults live in the deeper waters off the shelf, and they are fished by a, a more ocean-going fleet, larger boats. It's a distinct fishery from this one here. So two separate fisheries, two separate species of, of hakes. Turns out the juveniles of Merluceus paradoxus recruit from the shelf areas. So the adults, the larvae from the adults uh, drift onto the shelf, 
and the juveniles then um, live out their life there before they mature and then recruit us into the adult life stage off shelf in the deeper waters. Turns out the juveniles are a significant portion of the prey of Merluccius capensis. So there's a predator prey relationship here between the juveniles of one hake and the adults of another. Now, when we do a qualitative analysis of these systems, this is what we uh, predict. If you have a culling of seals with a single hakes model, you retrieve the same results that Peter Yotzitz got over here with the more complicated model. Increase the death rate to seals, that negative times a negative leads to an increase in the population of hakes, that positive times that positive predicts an increase to the fishery landings for the fleet of, uh, on the single species model. But when you have the two species model, we have an input to the uh, mortality rate of seals, so it's a negative effect here. That negative times a negative gives an increase to adults here, an increase to juveniles of Marunceus capensis, and an increase to the landings on the on-shelf fishery. However, it increases the rate of mortality on the juveniles, which equates to uh, Marunceus paradoxus, which equates to fewer adults off-shelf and decreased landings for the off-shelf or deeper water fishery. Now, unfortunately, it turns out that 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent of the fishery of the biomass landed comes from the deep water fishery. Thus, if this is the way the world works, culling of seals will lead to a decrease in the landings of the hake fishery for the Manguela upwelling system. So this is a critical difference in model structure. And here you would get the exact opposite intention of what you would hope for uh, if you had followed the more uh, complicated model where you have just a single um, species of hake or even the more simple model with a single species of hake. Hey, there's a spatial uh, distinction between these two populations, so this model is embedded within not only a species level distinction, but a spatial and an economic distinction. There's a lot of dynamics that are captured here simply by creating these life history stages, putting them in different habitats with different economic pressures on them, and different management structures uh, placed upon the variables. So even though this model only has say, seven variables, it may be much closer to the relevant subsystem needed to describe the system from a model that has uh, dozens of variables or one that has three. What we often find is that an intermediate mode of complexity is often has the highest uh, value in terms of utility in a modeling framework. And that's not just in, in qualitative models, that's generalizable to, to all modeling forms, statistical and numerical simulation models. So, here we've described a critical source of model uncertainty. We have uh, what everyone is most uh, in tune with is parametric uncertainty, and that's what Peter Yotzitz played with when he did the numerical simulation and varied the parameters in his models uh, based upon plausible distributions. But uh, there's this other source of model structure uncertainty that we just revealed in the last example from Benguela. And this, I believe, is a much larger problem um, than the parametric uncertainty. And thanks to Banksy, who made a, a lovely uh, example of the elephant in the middle of the room, we have an allegory for what Scott Fearson, somebody who is very deeply concerned about model uncertainties, um, he states that model structure uncertainty is the elephant in the middle of the room that no one talks about. There are two aspects of model structure uncertainty. There's between models where we have different interactions or different variables. This is what we just showed you in the example between the models of the Benguela upwelling system. But we also have within a single model, you have complex interactions that leads to, to uncertainty. And this is what we saw in the snowshoe hair example with model B. Because of those opposing forces, uh, vegetation working either directly to a uh, hair as a food source or as a potential source of cover to predators, it could have a positive or negative impact upon a variable, thus giving you an ambiguity in the response of hares due to fertilization of vegetation. So that's, um, that's uncertainty coming in within, a single, within the structure of a model.
because of, of countervailing feedbacks in the system. Now, the importance of defining the relevant subsystem is, is, is really the critical aspect and really the art of, of qualitative modeling or any modeling uh, um, approach. And you, you have to, uh, it's a contention here that the problem has to be posed big enough to accommodate an answer. So you need to have uh, the, re the, 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 the way you approach the problem, it has to be relevant to the problem at hand. Systems of interest are bigger and more complex than our disciplines, disciplines typically recognize or allow. So we need to have an approach that can pull these different um, unknown elements or contradictory elements into a common framework that we can examine them. And the relevancy is defined by the context of the problem, its essential dynamics, processes, and feedbacks of the whole system. So let's uh, have a... Um, a little sandbox exercise here, or play around with just a simple system, and just see how complicated we can make it, and to see at what point does it help us or hinder us in our uh, research program. So let's take a, um, a well-known uh, relationship uh, from in vitro studies, blood sugar regulation model, where insulin levels stimulate cells to accept more glucose into them and store them and get them out of the bloodstream. So the, the well-known uh, relationship between uh, insulin and blood glucose is that insulin suppresses blood glucose and blood glu glucose triggers insulin secretion from the pancreas. So this is a well-known predator-prey type relationship. And these would be the measured responses that you would get in, in in vitro studies. Now, let's take this uh, into a larger context and let's put this... Uh, blood sugar relationship into an organism that has uh, psycho psychological processes. So we have here uh, a human being that has uh, anxiety and anxiety leads to release of epinephrine and epinephrine can trigger increased anxiety. So here we have a positive feedback cycle between a person's level of anxiety and epinephrine in their blood. Blood glucose suppresses epinephrine levels and epinephrine levels stimulate glucose in the blood. Glucose can suppress levels of anxiety. So if, you're, um, if you have a, a person that's prone to anxiety, if they eat a candy bar, it can a raise in blood glucose can actually calm them down a little bit. So now we have a system with uh, some uh, negative feedbacks. We have three negative feedbacks. Here we have this one here between these two variables, and here we have this pathway from epinephrine to glucose and back to epinephrine, that's a negative feedback. We also have a negative feedback from glucose to anxiety to epinephrine back to glucose. However, this positive feedback here provides some interesting dynamics. If the strength of this positive feedback cycle is stronger than the combined effects of these three negative feedback cycles, so if a person is particularly prone to anxiety, and has a, a predilection to, incre to increase epinephrine um, production that feeds back and, and increases their anxiety in a cascading manner, then this system can be overrun by the positive feedback. And then, if this person were an individual in clinical trials that were being uh, measured blood glucose and insulin levels, the in vivo measured effects of this person would give the clinician the opposite measured response in their uh, monitoring of insulin and glucose levels in the blood. This is due to the positive feedback here inverting the expected responses of perturbations in the rest of the system. And this is a common theme and analysis tool of qualitative modeling, is to understand where positive feedbacks are in the system and how they impact measured responses elsewhere in the system. And you don't need to have precise measurements of this system, you only need to understand the, the, uh, the model structure and the implications to the overall feedbacks and understand if this is strong in its relationship to these other processes, then it can give you a counterintuitive effect. And this is really the strength of qualitative modeling is it informs your intuition about complexity and, sh and tells you where to expect counterintuitive responses before you even pull out your measuring tape or your glass tubes. Now let's in, uh, embed this system into a social system. So now our, 
our patient is now uh, not in the laboratory, but you're out on a fishing vessel and they have a um, honors thesis they need to complete with a tuna tagging study. And in the course of tagging tuna, they have a metabolic rate here, which uh, the activity of, of, of pulling the tuna out of the ocean into the tagging uh, bay uh, has a metabolic rate associated with it that is uh, associated with that student's research program. So that also has a negative uh, feedback on the blood glucose level, and so this is a stabilizing effect to the system. But we can mix it up a little bit and now put in the zoology department regulation model, adding to it, and now we have the honors uh, um, the, uh, supervisor saying they'd really like a lot more data and uh, would you please not take so many breaks um, having lunch and um, you can't really take time to, to eat and by the way you need to work harder. And so they're increasing the metabolic rate of the student and leading to anxiety because they're threatening them with a lack of funding in the latter half of their thesis if they don't get the move on and get more data. So this then can suppress and enhance the negative or positive feedbacks of the system and lead to a destabilizing, destabilization of the system based upon the pressure that the uh, honor supervisor is putting on the system. And the way to stabilize the whole system is to bring in the honors coordinator here, this, uh, this uh, wizened man uh, puts pressure on the honor supervisor and tells the uh, student to relax a bit, go ahead and take your lunch break. Uh, life need not be that hard and there is a future after your honors uh, thesis. So at what point do we stop adding to the system? At what point do we need to um, add or subtract variables? It's really up, because it's a qualitative approach, you can do these models quite quickly learn from it and decide what feedbacks, what variables are informative to your research program and what, which are superfluous. Um, and so that's a, a nice thing about qualitative modeling is you can quickly build these models and analyze them because they do, they're not burdened with the precision need uh, param and parameterization of all the parameters. You only need to have the sign of the effects between the different variables. So let's move on into a, a more um, embedded uh, real problem um, and let's, let's look at the uh, use of these qualitative models for uh, ecosystem modeling and ecosystem based management. And here there's a well known problem with um, quantitative ecosystem models, numerical simulation models. In the decision-making process, they have been criticized for their burdensome demands of collection and analysis of multi-scale data sets and a failure to keep pace with decision-making schedules. And Walters and Holland say it is a trivial task to define testable hypotheses, but it is not easy to generate hypotheses that are relevant to changes in the external context and the internal structure of managed ecosystems. Here, the essential challenge for ecosystem-based management is to quickly incorporate community level interactions and generate and proceed from critical and falsifiable hypotheses. This is critical if we're going to do science and not just arm waving. So the example I like to show you how uh, I try to implement this approach is with uh, the WIPA region of the Australia of Australia's northern prawn fishery. This is Australia's northern prawn fishery. It's one of the most productive fisheries in Australia. It has a long history of of uh, productive uh, population levels. Um, but up here in the WIPA region, right here specifically in Albatross Bay where this arrow is, over a, a six year period, they had near, uh, the, 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 the landings of the catch in the WIPA region collapsed. While the other regions, Mitchell and Corumba for comparison here, Mitchell and Corumba, these are the comparative regions here on the graph, they sustained normal levels of, of, of landings through this period. So in 2004, um, the, the, the management structure of the Northern Prawn Fishery, NORMAC, um, they called in CSIRO to do a uh, integrated assessment of what was going on in this system. So, <clears throat> Um, we looked at hypotheses for reduced catch of banana prawns in the Weeper region um, due to these hypotheses, recruitment over fishing, uh, a change in the environment, or maybe pollution, 
or perhaps there is reduced fishing effort in Weepa. Uh, maybe the fish, these are the trawl boats here, and these are the wings of the otter trawls that, that hold the, the trawl nets down onto the seafloor where they scoop up the prawns. Perhaps they had fewer boat days uh, in the region, to, to, and, and maybe that, that was the cause. Uh, or maybe there is reduced catchability of these trawl nets um, due to the prawns maybe remaining inshore. They either uh, stay in the mangroves or the estuaries, or they migrate offshore where they're vulnerable to the trawl nets. So maybe they were becoming less available to the fishery. Or maybe the, the prawns stopped aggregating into what they call balls. Um, when they spawn, they, they form these large, uh, bu dense biomass balls where they share sperm and eggs um, in the water. And there they're, they become quite vulnerable to the trawls um, where they can be located on the echo sounder or with planes flying overhead, they can see these balls, these aggregations, and direct fishing fleets towards them. So the approach we took was a statistical analysis of the population dynamics of the prawns with respect to the fishery and the environment. Uh, they did a numerical simulation modeling with ecopath, and then they, they has, asked me to do qualitative mathematical modeling and use that as a means to integrate all the other studies together. So today I'll just give you a, a brief overview of the results of those studies, but um, there's other papers you can read if you're interested for more detail. <clears throat> so I started out with just a minimal system, predators, prey, and prawn food. Uh, a three variable model, which you can describe as differential equations or community matrix or a sign directed graph. But then I took the, the step of splitting out the prawn variable here into a life stage model, here just a juvenile or adult, where we have the processes of uh, fecundity and maturation, uh, giving this uh, relationship here. I also chose to put it into a larval, juvenile, migratory, and adult life stage. Each of these life stages uh, were separated into different habitats. We have the offshore area, where the adults are vulnerable to the fishery, and where they have their own predators like sharks or uh, prey items or nutrition that uh, in competition with other prawns as well. Um, and we have the larvae which have their own predators which recruit into the estuary which has their own source of nutrients and their own predators. And in the inshore area where they migrate off uh, to the inshore area before they become adults and migrate offshore. So these different habitats, life stages, provided the means to plug in different uh, predator-prey relationships or different environmental factors. And here's the environmental and biological effects that are known from published studies in the WIPA region. As summer rainfall increases, uh, the food supply for larvae, juvenile, and adults are, is increased. Pond, uh, summer rainfall also increases prawn migration out of the estuary into the near shore environment and it also increases turbidity. Now, autumn rainfall decreases the nearshore salinity, and this decreased nearshore salinity increases the movement of prawns into the fishing grounds where they become vulnerable to the prawn trawling nets. Shark consumption of discards out of the trawlers because they don't catch just prawns, they catch other fishes, and the fishermen throw those discards overboard. That increases the local predation, predation pressure on the prawns because it attracts the sharks. Prawns, it turns out, are a minor component of the predator's diet. Thus, there is a negligible positive effect leading back to the predator, only a strong negative effect leading from the predator back to the prawn. Turbidity interferes with predator foraging. So more turbid waters, the prawns are less vulnerable to predation, much like um, the grass might hide rabbits or from predators if it had gone the other way with the hair link cycle. Um, mangroves trap and retain nutrients. Mangroves provide a refuge from predators and cover for the prawns. So all of these environmental and biological effects were put into the sign-directed graph. And here I've just said that the biological system is above and the environment and habitat is below this dashed line. So we have all the factors of uh, turbidity, mangroves, early precipitation in the season, late precipitation, salinity, and turbidity. 
And these impact the system in a multiple different ways, which are all encoded in the, uh, the research that we uh, documented. And we have the commercial fishery here, the catch, the effort, the market price, and the catch per unit effort. So we have economics in there, fishing effort uh, as well. We also have recreational fisheries on the predators of the prawns here, and so we could have the, the, the different sectors of the fishery in the, in the model. So based upon this, we can make predictions of how the system would change due to changes in the environment. And the statistical approaches that were taken documented most likely that there might have been changes in the uh, precipitation in the system early and late, and that was one of the avenues that we looked at. And so we made qualitative predictions for an increase in the early rainfall levels or the late rainfall levels. And you can see just based upon whether you get more rain early or late in the system, you have very, very different responses of the WEPA ecosystem due to this rainfall input. So if there's an increase in early rainfall, you expect an increase in adults and an increase in catch to the fishery. Um, over here, the input to uh, the, in the late season has a decrease in adults and an ambiguous response to the catch. So just having model structure here mediate these different inputs, we learn a lot about what to expect out of the system. And the statistical analyses of, the, of all the environmental data and the monitoring data we have for the WEPA prong populations could come up with no smoking gun to implicate environmental factors as a cause for the decline in the banana prong uh, pop, uh, catches in WEPA. Um, so, but anyway, we used the qualitative modeling tools to help inform the statistical analyses as best we could. And also, to, we tried this to help inform the numerical simulation model, the ecopath model. But uh, I must say the, the problem with that, with that was is that once the ecopath model decided on a single model structure, they spent the next two years parameterizing it. And they are, people who are making these models are not very happy about trying to change horses in midstream or model structure in midstream. And when I learned about other possible model configurations, they were not able to incorporate those into the ecopath model because it would have been too costly to re-parameterize the entire model uh, parameter space. So that is a, a real difficulty in, in communicating qualitative modeling results in an ongoing project with a complicated numerical simulation model is that once they come up with the model structure, they're pretty much set then to developing the parameter space to um, support it. And it's a difficult thing for them to be flexible. Now, when in the course of these, uh, this was a two-year workshop. We had uh, four or five workshop meetings over a two-year period. And in the middle of all of those workshops, I heard the fishermen complain about something. They said that in, in one year the fuel prices increased and they were loath to go back to WIPO and fish for banana prawns there early in the season because it would take them, if they did not catch banana prawns uh, in the early part of the season in WIPO, they would have to spend two days moving their vessels down to the southern regions of Mitchell and Corumba to start catching prawns in the middle part of the season or, or just after the start of the season. And so with an increase in fuel prices, they decided that they would not go to WIPA in some years. And so there was an opportunity cost that I heard in their narrative. It's amazing what you can learn out of a fisherman at the end of the workshop when a few beers are flowing around. Um, and I didn't learn this from the managers. I learned it from the captains of the vessels. And I didn't learn this from the fisheries biologists either that a really a strong behavior of the, of the um, fishing captains was the price of fuel and the amount of time it took to go between the different fishing grounds in the northern prawn fishery. So I thought about that for a while and then I went away and made this uh, uh, model here, which is an opportunity cost and effort allocation model for the Weeper region. And I simply divided the dynamics into here and there. Here is if you're in WIPA, and you're a fishing captain and you expend effort, that leads to some level of catch. If you have good catch, then you figure that there's a good benefit to cost ratio for fishing in the WIPA region. So that's the subset here, H, 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 all of these subscripts are here. So this is about fishing here in WIPA. Now, 
if you have reduced catch in there, then that would have the opposite effect. So that would make that into a negative, right? So anyway, you see that there's a positive feedback cycle here that if uh, catch redu uh, leads to an op uh, a benefit cost where you invest more effort to fishing in WEPA and you get more catch. Conversely, if there's an opportunity cost to fishing in WEPA, like fuel prices increase, then that decreases the benefit cost ratio for being in WEPA. That then leads to an impact on the effort in fishing outside of WEPA, which has an impact on the catch. This too is a positive feedback cycle. So if you have high catch outside of WEPA, that would make that a positive effect. That would make that a negative, and that negative times that negative would give to a more effort, and this would be a positive feedback cycle. So here we have these two opposing positive feedback cycles all impinging upon the benefit cost ratio here uh, for fishing here in WEPA. So what I was listening to was that there was a potential opportunity cost that might be triggered either by a low catch rate in one year or an increase in fuel prices in another year. And so I said I wanted to find out if there was any evidence for that in the catch and effort statistics for the different regions. And so I looked at these regression relationships between WEPA, Mitchell, and Karemba. Mitchell and Karemba are south in the center of mass uh, where most of the prawns are caught in the fishery outside of WEPA. And we find that in the previous year's catch, the effort that's allocated in the next year has no significant relationship for Mitchell and Karemba. The, this is a, a slope of zero here, pretty much. It's just statistically non-significant slope on these regression lines for previous years catch and effort in Mitchell and Karemba. But there's a highly significant um, nonlinear relationship between previous years catch and effort in WEPA, such that it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you didn't catch prawns last year, then you're not gonna expend effort this year. And that's consistent with this positive feedback cycle. So if you have a low catch, you perceive that as a low benefit cost ratio and you won't expend effort. And so uh, a negative input to catch in one year can kick off the cycle where it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and you never go back and try and catch them again. So this was a compelling hypothesis that I pulled out of the narratives of the fishermen and the workshops when they, when they started uh, having a few beers after the end of the workshops. So, um, you know, I learned something there and I translated that into a sign directed graph and I came up with some uh, testable hypotheses. And so, um, if you have this system and you have a positive input to the opportunity cost there, like an increase in fuel prices, then you will kick off this cycle where you can lead to a decrease in uh, the, the benefit cost ratio for being in WEPA, which leads to less effort. And uh, the catches become ambiguous though um, in this model because you have an increase in the stock abundance as well. But in generally though, it can lead to a positive uh, uh, feedback cycle where effort and catches are suppressed. And all the effort is shifted outside to the other regions. If you have a negative input from the environment into the stock, you'll kick off a similar, uh, in the weeper region, you'll, you'll get pretty much the same dynamic. So these, these positive feedback cycles or the, the reduction in effort can be attributable, attributed to a number of causes. So we had no clear way of knowing if it was caused by the environment or maybe an opportunity cost because of diesel prices, prices or something like that. We would get these same dynamics. So we had to come up with some way to cut through this conundrum uh, and, and see if we could uh, understand the system in a larger context. So we had this accidental management experiment come up. Um, during this time of these six years of low catches in WEPA, and we did our research here, published it here, the uh, NORMAC, or the, uh, the, um, the managers, managers, managers at the Northern Prawn Fishery, I uh, wanted to test the hypothesis that fishing effort had dropped off because of, of uh, fisher perception, um, you know, the positive feedback cycle. So they were, they were willing to uh, consider closing the season throughout the rest of the northern prawn fishery and allowing boats to fish in the weeper region only 
for the first few weeks of the season, which would remove the opportunity cost. So the fishermen would have no um, worry about missing out in a different part of the Gulf because they, the only place they could start was Weepa. However, because the managers were also deathly afraid that this low catch abundance was due to a, a collapse in the stock, they lost their nerve and did not want to commit the entire fleet of the northern prawn fishery to the Weepa region for the opening of the 2006 season. And so they, they pulled back from that management experiment that they had planned for a couple of years based upon our, um, um, our, our collective efforts of this whole statistical numerical simulation and qualitative modeling uh, um, approach and the re report that we gave from it. However, something accidental happened. They did these uh, starting in 2004, I believe, they started doing uh, juvenile surveys before the, each prawn season, uh, fishing season. And in 2006, and they had never seen this before in any other type of surveys, the catch rates for juvenile prawns in the Weeper region was dramatically um, magnitudes greater than any other place in the, where they did prawn surveys in the Weeper region. So these, this stood out so much that all the fishermen said, Weep is hot again, let's go. Um, that, that was their perception. So irrespective of the manager's fear that the, having the entire fleet start the, the season in Weepa, they did anyway because of the, um, this published, this actual, this one PDF sheet was sent through as a fax to all the fisheries managers along with a, a set of other, other analyses that they did with monitoring data. And everyone's eyes bugged out and said, we're going to Weepa at the beginning of the season in 2006. And that kick-started the fishery again. Uh, back 2006, they had a high level of effort, and they had a, a higher level of catch than they had in the previous six years. And ever since then, up until even now, the uh, Weeper region is getting catches commensurate with, it had, with what it had before 2000. So, so we still do not know emphatically whether or not the initial collapse of the catches in WIPA were due to the environment, due to economics or fishermen perception. Uh, we don't really know, but there's strong compelling evidence to say that at least near the end of this time series, that the perception was holding them back that um, low catch one year begat low effort the next, and the, the moment they started going back into fishing the WIPA region, the stock had either already had that abundance or it had recovered, we still don't know, but now it's, it's back to what it was before and the fishermen are uh, trusting that because last year's catch was good, they're going to go back this year. At least that's my interpretation of this set of uh, data. So I'm going to uh, end up now with uh, a, um, a brief uh, overview of some um, other things you can do with qualitative modeling to show you that um, we can have a positive input to uh, epiphytic algae here. Actually, I need to, I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip these few slides and go on to the end of the talk. Sorry. I think I've taken too much time elsewhere, but this isn't that useful or necessary. So let me summarize by saying that qualitative models um, can reveal implications of system structure to the dynamics and mechanistic models. And they provide causal explanation for observed correlation patterns and statistical models. So that's their greatest use in terms of um, mutual benefit to other modern frameworks. Statistical models provide quantification of the magnitude and uncertainty of parameters in mechanistic models and hypotheses for system dynamics and relationships in qualitative models. Mechanistic or numerical simulation models provide predictions for magnitude of effects in statistical models, and they reveal the implications of parameter strength in qualitative models. Each has a use, each has a compensatory or, or um, I mean, a, um, a useful effect for the other modeling frameworks. So if we want robust theorems, they need to be by different lines of evidence. And so we can never settle upon a maximization of one true model that maximizes everything because you, you really can't. There's, there needs to be a trade-off. And so we need to have multiple modeling approaches that, that um, pr 
provide these different views of the world, but hopefully co converge upon a similar result. And this provides us uh, tools of understanding causality when we embrace reality, uh, when we embrace thresholds. I mean, precision, we can gain understanding of thresholds. And we, it's very important for science to be falsifiable. So we need to have all of these elements to have a good research and management program for complex systems. And so um, I'll, I'll end on this and 